cataractcoach.com. And I want to tell you about a new feature we're going to have here on our channel, and that's the Cataract Coach curriculum. Now, there's so many videos at this point, 1,500 videos and growing. So sometimes it's hard to keep track of what's been done before, especially if you're watching them only on YouTube. As you know, if you go to the cataractcoach.com website, it's a far better search engine. Everything's indexed. It's a lot easier to learn from those videos than watching it here only on YouTube. We have a curriculum that we've designed now for young doctors who are in their training to learn ocular surgery, in particular, cataract surgery. And so I present to you our cataract coach curriculum. Twice a month, we're gonna feature a set of videos that all have the same theme. Like today, the theme is setting up in the operating room, ergonomics, position of the patient, things of this nature. Next time, it's going to be ocular anesthesia. Then we'll focus on incisions. Then we'll focus on hand positioning and pivoting and, in, and capsular rexus and hydrodissection. You can imagine we have a whole lot of great material. So check it out, starting with today, a total of four videos every, every other Sunday for our curriculum. And again, today's video is setting up in the operating room. CataractCoach.com, surgeon ergonomics for ocular surgery. This is actually a surprisingly important topic. So let's look at the microscope oculars first. Now I prefer a slight downward gaze or downward approach. That's the most comfortable for me. Some people like it parallel to the floor. The one I don't like at all is when you're looking up. I think that's straining your eyes, your neck, your head. It's not a good position. So decide what angle you like in the oculars. I suggest a slight downward tilt. Now let's look at the FACO foot pedals. We've got the two foot pedals here. I traditionally have the FACO pedal for the right foot, the microscope on the left foot. You want to have the pedals in front of you. You look down at the oculars as we showed you, that spe specific angle, adjust it for your comfort. Remember, if you have the oculars more flat or parallel to the ground, then the scope height's going to change very significantly. And that's that uncomfortable position of looking up. So I like a slight downward tilt. I think that's the most comfortable. And now look. The body's nice and straight and the hands are there and that's a good position. Now, if the scope is a little bit farther away from you, now you'll have to lean forwards and that's gonna put strain and stress on your back. So get the patient's eye a little closer to you so that the scope can be closer to you. And then you can have your back straight up and down with a slight tilt here, maybe even a little less than that. That looks a little bit more appropriate. So back nice and straight. Your back's perpendicular to the ground. Your 90 degree bend here at the elbow joint. And that's a nice comfortable position. Looking at the pedals, again, FACO pedal on the right, the MISCO pedal on the left. I tend to operate like this resident is doing, which is just using my socks. I kick the shoes off and I just use socks to operate. Now look at the focusing tube here on the scope. Now we can have it straight up and down. I like that. I tend to make it perpendicular to the floor of the room. There is an adjustment on the side and you can t t tilt um, the scope and have it more of an angle. Some people like that as well. All of those are reasonable. Obviously, when you're doing surgery in the angle of the eye with a gonio mirror or gonio prism, you have to tilt it even more. But my preference for the central tube of our microscope is to have it perpendicular to the floor. And remember, I also like the patient to have their eye with the iris parallel to the floor. So let's straighten that back out, get it nice and straight. And there's a, a mark on the side here that tells us when it's perfectly perpendicular to the ground. And we can have that adjusted just so. And that looks great. You wanna be very comfortable in the way that you operate. Also, if you have it straight up and down perpendicular, you're going to have a better red reflex. You're gonna have a reflection of the light back. This is showing that the focus is in the center. There's a button up at the top here to reset. That'll reset the X, Y, and Z, as well as the zoom. So you wanna reset that at the beginning of your case. Now look at the oculars. You need to dial in your appropriate prescription. Now both of your eyes have the same prescription, then you should both have the ocular set at zero. So an emetropic person and an emetropic surgeon should have it zero on both. Now if you have a little myopia, you may want to dial that in. So here you can dial in a little bit more myopia shown here on the right ocular, a little less myopia on the left. The key here as well is you want to have 
this dialed in so that you are in perfect focus on the eye at the same time the camera is in perfect focus. If you're a young surgeon and tend to accommodate too much, you can dial a little minus in here and that'll help absorb that. But make sure the camera is focused the same way. Now positioning here, the hands. So there's the patient, iris is parallel to the floor. That's a good position. Setting this up before you do the preparation, before any kind of block, before doing anything. Get the patient in the appropriate position. Now, surgeon should be comfortable first. So surgeon puts his or her chair at the appropriate height, puts the microscope where, you, you, where he or she wants it, and then bring the patient's entire bed or table up or down in order to have the correct focus. So here we go, feet on the pedals, going nicely underneath the bed, that looks great. Surgeon's back is nice and straight, looking slightly down, that looks like it's a good position. There's a 90 degree bend in the arms. Patient's eye is close to the surgeon so he doesn't have to lean his body forwards. That looks great and now you can use the control of the bed and bring the patient up or down to get the initial focus. And that is a great start for ergonomics, an important topic when you start to do a ton of surgery. Cataractcoach.com, how to drape the eye without touching the eyelids for cataract surgery. Let me show you my technique. Here's how we do it at our Beverly Hills Surgery Center. We place this first drape that has a cutout for the eye and it's adhesive and that sticks around the face and has a nice seal and the eyelids are now exposed. We don't touch the eyelids. We're just touching the drape. Now my assistant will use a stary strip and the back end of a wax cell to lift up that upper lid and now I'll place this tegaderm and that'll get every single eyelash out of the way. We'll do it for the lower lid as well. And so without touching the skin at all, we're able to drape it so that every single eyelash is out of the way and there's a clear plastic drape around the lid margin. Here's it being done in a different facility. This is not our Beverly Hills Center. It's not me doing this procedure, but I wanted to show you a different technique. In this technique, the patient's eyes again exposed and the surgeon now is gonna get a plastic drape and when applying this, the skin has been prepped with povidoiodine and so betadine. He's going to use his actual fingers touching the eyelid skin, which has been cleaned with the betadine solution. Then he'll put the clear drape down and then opening up this drape. And this is perfectly acceptable also. Now the question is, how obsessive are you about not touching the skin? The skin was prepped with the betadine solution. It is sterile. Certainly when you operate on any other part of the body, the skin is being prepped in the same way and it's considered sterile. And so now he's incising the drape right down the middle there, putting a little extra towel here to absorb any fluids during the procedure. And then a speculum is gonna go inside the eye. And the goal of the speculum is to make sure those plastic drapes encompass and go around the lid margin. So you can see that's very good. Every eyelash is out of the way and underneath the drape. Here comes a speculum being placed. This is a nasal speculum, much like the one that I use. And as the drape is op uh, spread apart by the speculum, we'll see that plastic drape will go around the lid margins. There we go. And this also is very effective in getting every single eyelash out of the way. So I'll zoom in here, show you that view. And he's adjusting his speculum. And that looks great, good exposure. Again, completely isolating the eyelash margin. I think that's the key for our surgeries. Avoids the contamination by oil and or debris. Let's go back to Beverly Hills. This is the same part I showed you at the beginning of this video, how we drape in Beverly Hills. So the cutout drape goes on first and has a built-in pouch there to catch fluid. In my right hand, I have the tegaderm drape that's been cut in half. My assistant will then use a single stereo strip and open up that eyelid. There's a tegaderm being placed on the upper eyelid and there's another one on the lower eyelid. And again, never touching the eyelid with my gloved hands. Speculum goes in the eye and we're ready to go. So however you do it, let me know. Cataractcoach.com, my secret for draping the eyelids. We want to sequester the lid margin and keep all those lashes out of our surgical field. So here's the beginning of the case. We've placed a clear plastic drape over the entire eye while it's open. 
And now we'll use scissors to incise the center of that right over the cornea with care taken not to touch the cornea or scrape it. And now we'll place the speculum. And as we place the speculum, we want the drapes to go around the lash margin and the lid margin and to be on the undersurface of the lid too. And now we have complete sequestration of the lid margin and all eyelashes away from the surgical field. This is a nice, clean surgical field. Let's show you again. So drapes are placed here on the eye. This patient has very long eyelashes, a younger patient. We'll use our drape scissors to cut across the drape right in the middle. And now we'll put our speculum in. And again, the goal of the speculum is placed on top of the drape we want to get the drape around the lid margin completely. And when we place this here, you can see even this patient with long eyelashes, they're all out of the surgical field. And this is going to make the rest of the surgery easier, better visibility, less oil on the ocular surface, and most importantly, lower risk for infection. Here you go at the end of the case. We'll take the speculum out, and it goes beautifully. Remember, the source of the infection for endophthalmitis is almost always the patient's own eyelashes and eyelids. So there you go, the drape comes off, and that eye looks great. The incision's already sealed, so it's a sterile environment. Now, don't do it this way. Here's an anonymous surgeon. Please do not drape the eyelids like this. You see the lash margin is exposed. The eyelashes are touching the ocular surface. The drape is blocking part of your surgical field, your view. This is a very high risk for endophthalmitis, especially if you look carefully, the posterior capsule is already ruptured in this case. So you definitely need to do a better job of draping the lashes. You do not want the eyelashes or lid margin exposed to your surgical field for intraocular surgery. Very important to get them completely draped out of the way. So this is the method that I like to do. Now here's another case of good draping. This is done by my resident. So it's been placed over the eye, big plastic drape, and sized down the middle. Now after the prep with povido iodine, you need to make sure it fully dries so that these adhesive drapes will stick. They tend not to stick to the corneal surface or ocular surface because it's wet, which is good, but it will stick to the eyelid margin. So the speculum now is placed, and you can see this is a small pupil cataract case. And as we open that speculum, it wraps around the lid margin. So we have a very nice exposure with no lashes in the surgical field. Now we're ready for surgery. And this works very well for the vast majority of your cases. Here's an unusual case. This patient actually had eyelashes coming out of that medial canthal area. So those we couldn't drape as effectively, but still our surgical field was quite clean. So please take pride in your draping, do a beautiful job, and let's sequester those lids and the lid margin. Check out cataractcoach.com, our teaching website, a lot of great material. Click on the link there to get a free email every day. You'll learn something brand new. Thanks. Cataractcoach.com. Keep the iris parallel to the floor during cataract surgery. It's actually very important to have the proper eye position. So this is a patient who's having routine cataract surgery. Again, fairly routine case, everything's going to go just fine. But look at the image of the Purkinje reflections, those three lights right in the center. That looks good. At this point, the patient's eye is in a totally normal position. So this is iris parallel to the floor, and the surgery proceeds very well. It's very easy to do. This requires the patient to keep their chin up. So at the beginning of the case, I like to actually tape the patient's head with paper tape to the operating room table in the appropriate position. Now, it's not a very strong tape, it's just paper tape, but it just serves as a gentle reminder to the patient to keep their head still and look at these lights. And when they do that, you can see certainly this part during the capsorexis, everything's easy, it goes great. It's a beautiful dilation, we're finishing our rexus, using those forceps to measure to make sure it's the appropriate size. This should be just about a five millimeter rexus. And at the end here, we can measure it if we need to. But during this procedure, the patient gets a little sleepy from this intravenous sedation that was given. And because of that, the patient ends up moving the head. And that primarily means the chin going down. 
So with the chin down, you can see a little of it now. Look at the Purkinje images, which are no longer in the center of the eye. The chin is down a little bit here. Now, when we have two instruments in the eye, such as the phaco probe in the right hand and the chopper on the left, with two instruments fixating the eye, we can move the eye back into primary. So we'll buzz in the center of the nucleus, chop the nucleus in half, take out each half. During this part, it's not too bad. We can actually use our two instruments to control the eye position. And you can see, again, the Purkinje images are pretty much in the center of the cornea. Now, there's a little movement in various directions, and we just straighten that out. And again, with two instruments, two-point fixation, we really control eye position a lot. Even then, it's a little bit of chin-down position. Again, this is the patient's left eye, and so the eye is not quite centered. Now, when we come out of the eye with our instruments, you can see that light reflex, again, is not where we want it to be. One last little piece of nucleus. We'll get out here with the phaco probe. Just a little quick buzz there. There we go. During irrigation aspiration as well, when we have an eye probe in the eye, we can pretty much control the eye position by the way that we pivot in the incision. Light pressure on different walls of the incision will help move the eye. So again, going around completely, it's no problem. Primarily, it's when you have no instruments in the eye. And I'm going to show you here, towards the end of the case, once we have the IOL inside the eye, it's going to look decentered, but it's not. The rex is well centered here, the lens will go in the bag, the lens will center well. But we have that parallax because the patient has that chin down position. So this is why it's very important, especially if you're just starting off here, as best you can keep the patient's iris parallel to the floor. Now certain patients with other issues, such as kyphosis or spinal issues, may have a tougher time being positioned, and advanced surgeons can certainly work in non-primary positions. What we want to do is have the patient in the primary position. So there's the viscoelastic going in the eye. Look where the light reflexes now. So this is chin way down. I help the patient. See that? Lifting the chin up. Keep that chin up. Now the light reflexes are back in the center. Makes it a lot easier to get the lens in. Here comes our lens. We'll get that in the capture bag and make sure it opens up completely and that the rexus overlaps the optic. And again, look at the drift of the patient's head. So the chin drifts down, the patient's a little sleepy, maybe got a little too much sedation, and the eye's not in primary. See the light reflexes? They're not in the center anymore. So let's put the eye probe in the eye, remove our viscoelastic, and finish up the case. And at the end of the case, I think you're really going to see the same issue, patient not keeping the eye in primary because the chin's down. Easy for the patient to look straight ahead. When the chin is down for this eye, the patient, to look at the light, actually has to look up. And as we know, the eye has much less ability to look up than it does to move in other directions. Up gaze is quite limited compared to down gaze or lateral gaze. So finishing up the case here, now we can also look at the Purkinje images off of the lens. You don't even see it yet, the eye is so far out of alignment. There it is a little bit. See, where's the? that's the lens Purkinje image just there on the edge of the optic. Now you see it. So if this eye was perfectly lined up, you'd see both Purkinje images at about the same position. But now look, where is that second Purkinje image? Actually, it's the fourth image. That's the one that's inverted. Yeah, it's not even on the IOL optic. So we only see one Purkinje image now because this lens is in the eye beautifully, but the patient's looking down. So let's seal up the incisions. And just to prove it to you, let's go back in the eye and we'll center up the lens, or so you think, and all we're really doing is lining up the Purkinje images. See that? Now with the Purkinje images lined up, we know the eyes in the normal primary position. The iris is parallel to the floor. There are the two Purkinje images, the first and the fourth. And now I know everything looks great. So thank you for watching, and remember, iris parallel to the floor. CataractCoach.com, the correct way to hold a fluid syringe, you have to hold the cannula base. So here we see a resident who's operating at the end of the case, sealing up the incision. Look at the hand position. The right hand is holding the BSS on a cannula like a pencil, basically. But importantly, holding the very tip. And the reason is the very tip can shoot off. There are many published studies of a cannula being shot off the tip of the syringe because of the high pressure. 
So to avoid this potential risk, we adjust our fingers and grab and hold that tip, holding the cannula tip as we advance the plunger with the other hand. This ensures that no matter what, the cannula is not going to be released inside the eye and will not cause iatrogenic trauma. Very important. Every cannula you hold should be just like that. I remind you to please go to cataractcoach.com, sign up and join our free email list. And also, there's a link for you to submit your video for expert review. Thanks for watching.